Uh, good morning. Salam alaikum. Um, this is track B, Muslim beliefs and behaviors across different stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. So just double check that you're in the track you want to be. Um, all right. So it is my distinct honor to introduce our panel of esteemed speakers this morning. We have with us today Dr. Rania Awad. She's the clinical associate professor in the Stanford Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. She is also a researcher and the director of the Stanford Muslims and Mental Health Lab, where she mentors and oversees multiple lines of research focused on Muslim mental health. Also today, we have with us Yusuf Salam Khan. He's a member of the Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab, focusing on research of the understanding of psychology throughout Islamic history. He joins us today from Zaytuna College in Berkeley, California, which is the first accredited Muslim undergrad college in the US founded in 2008. Uh, next, we have with us Dr. Fatima Kamran. Um, who is a consulting clinical health psychologist at the University of Punjab. She's currently a postdoc at Royal Holloway, University of London, and holds an academic professorship at the University of Punjab, Lahore. Um, we also have with us Dr. Reza Nasiri, and he's a professor of clinical pharmacology, professor of family and community medicine, and a lecturer in global health, infectious diseases, and tropical medicine at Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine. Professor Nasiri works on international public health issues and has expertise in global health education, research policy, and governance. I believe we have um, Professor Rafia here as well, so you can go ahead and All right. introduce them. Thank you. Um, and finally, we have with us Dr. Rafia Rafiq, and she's a professor in applied psychology and currently serving as a director of the Institute of Applied Psychology, University of the Punjab, Pakistan. She completed her postdoc from University of Nottingham, UK, and she recently got funding to supervise an indigenous postdoc in psychology for the first time in Pakistan. She was recently awarded the Pride of the Nation Award for mental health services that she rendered during COVID. All right. Um, I think that is all of our speakers. And with that, assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, welcome you all to track B um, to our speakers, presenters, and everyone who is um, joining us today. I will now um, pass on the screen to Dr. Awad to start her first presentation. Screen's yours, Dr. Alwa. Thank you so much and welcome everybody. Good morning and good afternoon, wherever you might be at the moment. Here in California, we are in good morning mode. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to be starting a, um, and sharing my screen here, hopefully. It lets me do this. There we go, excellent. And I'm beginning my discussion today um, and uh, looking forward to the rest of the panel. Today I'll be presenting a really important, I hope, um, and really large actually study related to the largest, we think, related to uh, COVID and Muslims. This is a large study that um, in which there was about 9,000 participants globally and um, all trying to figure out how Muslims have been doing in different stages of the pandemic related to their religiosity, their coping, and their mental health. With that, I'm going to just share the partners. My own lab, the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab, um, was a partnered with, and I put here the website so you're able to follow us and um, know where we're at. Our partner was also the Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research, um, who conducted the study itself, and then we helped analyze and um, right up actually the study. So with that, letting you know who our partners are, we'll start then discussing briefly about COVID-19. So as you know, there have been a disproportionate number of lives that have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll focus on the United States for the moment here and say that we have found that within minority groups, the COVID-19 pandemic has really hit those minority groups more than other groups. It has a very high economic burden with lives lost and also with jobs lost, as well as hitting 
um, mental health, at elevating mental health distress in really the whole entire general population. And when you look at the American population in general, you find that nearly half or more have actually reported pandemic related stress, if not full on mental health distress. We were very interested in how people were coping and because Muslims are a faith group, we decided to look at religion and, re and spirituality and how people were using this. What sparked our interest was actually a study that preceded ours by the Pew Research Institute that conducted a study about this time last year. It was April of 2020, right after the pandemic started. And they were actually looking to see how people were doing in terms of faith and what kind of coping mechanisms they were utilizing. What they found, interestingly enough, was that 24% um, of Americans were relying on religion and finding that their faith was actually much more uh, higher than other times of the year. So this was a spike that they found. So we thought we should probably repeat the same study and see what happens in the Muslim population along with a whole host of other factors that we studied as well. And there was a similar study soon thereafter conducted on the American Orthodox Jewish community that also found that religiosity and trust in God was increased and that it was correlated with decreased stress. So we were finding this kind of across religious groups. Now, when we look at the Muslim tradition, what we found in terms of COVID-19 was that there was a prophetic hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that we have listed here on the slide, that says, do not enter a land in which there is a plague and do not flee from the land in which there is a plague. Reminding Muslims that when there is a contagion, and this was something that didn't happen in the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, but rather he was foretelling and foreshadowing what was coming. And because there was actually religious injunction from the hadith here on what to do, many Muslims, especially when COVID-19 happened, they went back to, well, what does our religion say? What is the religious injunction here? And there is directions on what to do. And there's also a foretelling um, because of the Quranic verses that speak about that God, Allah, would be testing mankind and that this would be, we are in a, this world that we live in is, in a, is called the abode of tribulation, that it would be a time of potential testing. But there were also people wondering whether this is a punishment of some sort to mankind. And there was some debate related to this. So we thought we would test this as well, and we'll tell you what we found. And we wanted to measure specific measures of anxiety and depression. So we looked at uncertainty tolerance, which is a factor of anxiety, and also for religious coping, and really finding where people were doing with their faith. You might remember as well that in the Hajj season of last year, um, whereas there would normally be you know, 2.5 million people attending the Hajj, it was severely limited to just 1,000 people very, 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 very small numbers. And for a period of time, the Haram al-Sharif, the, the holy mosques, were closed and shut down. And for many Muslims, that is, you know, the, kind of the, the center of Islam and the place in which they look to for, um, you know, religious, uh, religious connection. And to see it shut down almost was like a parallel to how the whole world was doing and how they themselves were doing. And the fact that Ramadan entered in last year, right after COVID started, uh, the pandemic rather started, and of course we are about to enter our second Ramadan just next week, also in pandemic mode, um, also really changed how it is that Muslims were looking at uh, and, and, and kind of worrying about the COVID-19 pandemic and then celebrating Eid in a distanced manner as well. And so for us, we as researchers thought, well, for sure, life has been very difficult for Muslims, uh, really globally, worldwide, Islamophobia, and so on. And we thought everything that's happening with COVID, for sure, Muslims would be doing significantly worse. This was our premise, our theory, as we started off our research. As researchers do, you put a theory in place and you kind of go and see what test your, <laughs> test your theory and hypothesis. But what we found, interestingly enough, was, you know, a kind of a different story being told. I'll put a few slides here quickly to show what it is we were doing in terms of our research questions and our um, different stages that we tested 
in the pandemic. We wanted to ask about isolation and their beliefs. We wanted to ask about how people were feeling about having a very different Ramadan. We also wanted to test after Ramadan how people actually did. And then like I mentioned, we wanted to test about factors of anxiety and depression. So what we did essentially is we looked at, um, and you look at the dates here of when we were putting out these studies, the first one actually was really within that first week after the pandemic, or at least the shutdown and the quarantining was happening. So it was very early on in the first month of the pandemic. And then after that, there was one pre-Ramadan and one post-Ramadan. There was actually a fourth study as well that's on, on this table that, was, that happened in the summer here in the US when there was quite a bit of social unrest and upheaval. So we checked the pulse multiple times, if you will, throughout the course of um, the pandemic in the first part of it. And we found, um, you know, like I said, 9,000 people globally took this study. We isolated for Muslims who were living as minorities in non-Muslim majority lands. So North America, Europe, New Zealand, Australia, really the Muslim diaspora. That's what we focused on. And that's the results I'm gonna share with you next. And so our measures were really a combination between the scales that were previously validated from before related to anxiety, depression, mindfulness, uncertainty, intolerance, and also newly constructed measures that we came up with ourselves. And for analysis, what we ended up doing is, you know, kind of your, your typical, um, your typical uh, descriptive statistics and regression models. So here are some of our results. If you look at the first stage of the pandemic, one of the most important things we've tried to figure out was what were people believing about COVID-19? Well, you might be <laughs> interested to know that actually the majority of Muslims believed that this was a test from God versus a punishment. And this was very telling and important because it really could have gone either way. There was a lot of debate in the community anecdotally that we would hear about people saying this or that. But really when, when numbers, you know, objectively as we measured it, we found that actually people felt that this was a, a, a test from God. And when they did believe so, it was positively correlated with religious coping mechanisms like reading the Quran frequently, for example. Whereas those, the minority of people that believed that it was a test from God you could find that actually they had a lot more negative coping mechanisms that they were engaging in. And that, that's an important finding um, that we came through. Also related to mental health in that early, early stage of COVID about a year ago from now, you find that people were still very early in the process. And so there was not, um, there were some reporting mental health concerns, you know, poor mental health, about 11%, but not the majority. And you also find that there was, you know, seeing blessings and religious perceptions towards uh, the COVID-19 that when they saw blessings or a silver lining related to COVID, like being able to imagine what else could this mean or be, there it was positively correlated with gratitude, with praying five times a day, and with reading the Quran. And these are um, interesting findings because depending on how people were coping, you find, you know, what it is that people were believing in as well. Now, that next stage of the quarantine, I mentioned how we would be looking at pre-Ramadan. There was a lot of angst in the community, anecdotally, about how will they have a Ramadan that is without community, because community Ramadan is such a communal month of breaking fast together, of praying together, the extra prayers, the tarawih in the mosque, of going to the mosque, of visiting each other socially, and everything was shut down. So, we wanted to test people's pulse really on how they were feeling about this. And here you see that the numbers, or the percentages related to mental health start to rise a little bit more. We're a little further into the pandemic now. So 12% versus the 11% you saw before that met the cutoff for major depressive disorder. And you do so find that anxiety measured on the GAD7 or anxiety scale is also increasing compared to previous. And um, interestingly enough, this concept of uncertainty intolerance, which I'll speak about um, more and more, there's a really important this last bullet on the slide is very important, that we actually found that when a person had increased uncertainty intolerance, the inability to tolerate that uncertainty of what's going to happen next with the pandemic, actually increased their odds of having MDD or major depressive disorder by nearly 60%.
So we found a direct clinical correlate between how people were functioning and how much anxiety, how much anxiety or uncertainty they could tolerate and major depressive disorder. This was a very important and key finding of the entire study. Oops. In terms of general coping and negative coping and positive coping, I'll just very quickly define what these mean. That when we talk about when we talked about general coping, it was really more things like walking outdoors or people were home, so they were, you know, putting their energy into cleaning the house more, versus negative coping was things like using alcohol or drugs or illicit um, substances or watching illicit materials, so on and so forth, versus positive or, or uh, you know, coping mechanisms or religious rather coping mechanisms we found were where people were engaging in more reading of, of Quran or making more supplication, du'a. Um, and we found a lot of times that people were engaging actually potentially in all three, but there were definitely higher levels of religious coping and general coping with religious coping being the highest of all amongst the Muslim population. Now, I wanna just shift uh, and tell you a little bit about the relationship with Allah, because remember I said at the very beginning, we were interested in what the Pew Research Center had found and what was the correlate with the Muslim population. Well, we found that you know, there was actually a higher um, number of Muslims that were reporting that relationship, a stronger relationship with God related to the pandemic. And this was actually much higher than we found across um, other faith groups. So if you add the two percentages there together, you find that, you know, roughly over 60% of Muslims are saying that they are, uh, nearly 70 actually, are saying that they are having a stronger relationship with God. Now remember the original percentage from the Pew Research Center was 24%. So there is a much higher correlation here amongst Muslims than we're finding with other faith groups. That made us wonder, what is it about Islam itself that is causing that stronger relationship with God? And I'll get to that very, very shortly. But first, I want to share with you the final stage, which is the post-Ramadan stage from last year. And we were curious then, how did people actually do? People were so worried. How did they actually do? Well, 73% of Muslims reported having a better Ramadan in 2020 than they had ever had before. This was so surprising to us. Probably the most surprising of all of the um, of all of the statistics that we were able to analyze and find and report here. Um, and when we tried to sort out why exactly was this happening, there was a lot of interesting kind of um, factors related to this. Many mentioned how Ramadan, because it was its, in its essence, is meant to be a very introspective and reflective month. Having that isolation almost like thrust upon us caused people to be able to sit in one place and meditate and reflect and pray and really engage in spiritual practices, sometimes where the social and communal aspects of Ramadan had taken over for many people, how they lived and how they experienced Ramadan, this changed in the pandemic. And suddenly there was not having those social circles and support. Um, they were then able to really focus much more, you know, deeply into that introspection and self-reflection. Another aspect was that a lot of the programming turned virtual in Ramadan, and many people actually um, commented and took uh, hold of the virtual programming their mosques or you know, Muslim centers were offering and felt that that was a really great substitution. We also found that philanthropy were really interested because it's a month of charity as well in Ramadan, and we were wondering were people able, considering that COVID had hit, you know, their finances, were they able or not able to uh, be as charitable as they wish? And we actually found that people, you know, it was roughly about a third donated less, a third donated more, and about a third donated the same. So we couldn't really, there wasn't a specific pattern that we saw necessarily. And in terms of um, so social isolation, people were saying that when they experienced a good Ramadan, it was positively associated with really having, um, you know, uh, being able to access that content online, the virtual content, and being able to pray more and we've put on more. Many, 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 many people mentioned how it was really the first time they were able to pray tarawih, particularly amongst women. We now had their male folk at home with them and were praying at home, and many times they were not accessing the mosque in any way, and now people were praying at home and so were they. 
and there was a lot of virtual content that they were able to engage in, whereas previous they didn't have necessarily access to it. So this was a very interesting change. Um, unexpected, <laughs> but very interesting. And so in kind of just um, wrapping up our discussion here, and sharing a few more points in, in, in finishing here, when we look at how COVID affected Muslim practice, we find that actually this religious participation that always had been tied to mosque attendance and how mosque attendance was very much connected to a better outcome in terms of mental health, this changed in COVID because there was no mosque attendance. And what we found actually is that Muslims were able to, here we go, that Muslims were able to have, um, you know, higher levels of uh, feeling really connected to God without having necessarily attending the mosque. We also found that because the Ramadan experience, which was very unique in comparison to Islamic history, um, people were able to have, to, to uh, change, kind of like adapt their Ramadan to this new virtual and isolated environment that they were in. And even though there were challenges, as we mentioned, of mosque closures and, you know, the holy mosque closing for a period of time and Hajj looking significantly different than it ever had in the past, we found that nearly 70% of Muslims reported having that improved relationship with God compared to the overall 24% of the American population. And so, when we think about why is that the case, I promised I would get to that point. In closing here, is why is that the point? You find that in the Islamic belief system, it's very holistic in its nature. And there is a lot of emphasis on looking at um, all the difficulties God sends our way as part of this worldly life, the hayat dunya, this worldly life as the verse in the Quran mentions. And so for many Muslims, religious coping was really the most frequently observed mechanism in this sample that we looked at. And the numerous hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the, the ayat of the Qur'an that refer to seeing the blessings in the test that's being given is something that actually helped people. Uh, you know, people talked about repenting and getting closer to God, and that actually validated our theory. And lastly, when you look at this concept of uncertainty tolerance that I presented, it became a very important part of the discussion because despite, we found actually despite a person's religiosity, having that high degree of uncertainty intolerance really made it more likely that they would suffer from MDD. So our takeaway from this entire study is the importance of bringing that down, whether through religious coping or otherwise, so that you know, not having a mental health core like major depressive disorder would also come down. And that's an incredible, uh, incredibly important uh, final kind of point in the study. And with that, I'll end with um, lastly, this last slide here of just resources. I'll let you know that this middle book here called Islam, Muslims of COVID-19 is where our study will be published very shortly uh, along uh, in Brill as an accepted study. Other variations of our studies also um, in other journals, you'll find it in April at the end of the month coming out in the Journal of Islamic British Medical Association. And the other books to the right and to the left of this, our books, um, these ones here have been published um, so that you're able to take a look at them in the future. And the one after that, the APA uh, book that's coming up, we're really happy about publishing a book on Muslim mental health for the American Psychiatric Association. So just letting you know that these are here to keep track of them going into the future. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. And I hope this was a useful presentation. I look forward to the discussion later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Awaz. Um, what an, what an eye-opening insight um, in terms of your data. Um, we're ready to move onwards and upwards to our next presenter. Our next presentation will be the, um, actually he's right here. So Musaf, take the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming and uh, thank you to Dr. Anya for your wonderful presentation that I believe plays very nicely into this next presentation that we have titled Insights from the Muslim Plague History to the COVID-19 Era, the Role of Faith and Spirituality and Psychosocial Aspects of Pandemics. And so the background for this, uh, for our paper and for this presentation is looking at 
how we as Muslims in our modern community will be forming long-term coping systems for the pandemic. So as the pandemic had been progressing and we've been facing all these seemingly new and novel uh, crises and struggles in both mental health and in the way that our lives were changing, what, how do we form these new systems of how we interact with our world and with ourselves? And the basis for this paper is we're looking at not trying to form completely new systems, but looking at our history and seeing both uh, in terms of our religion and in terms of our history, what we can build in terms of coping mechanisms and also in terms of meaning making of our situation. So from looking throughout our Islamic history, we find that for one thing, the first, uh, the first finding that we have is that this is not the first time that Muslims have faced a pandemic. In fact, it's something that's recurred uh, pretty frequently throughout our Islamic history and throughout what the chroniclers have recorded. We see many scenes, some of which are very similar to what we see today in terms of uh, having to close um, public spaces, even at uh, times closing the masjid, closing mosques, and the different uh, in quarantine, these different ideas are not completely new to our history. And so there's two aspects to the, our tradition that we, can that we can find answers to how we build these mechanisms. And the first is was uh, prescriptive from the hadith and the Quran. Our scripture gives us direct injunctions on how we should respond to times of crisis and to times of, uh, of disease and times of fear. And then on the other hand, we also have the historical accounts. Our this Islamic scholarly tradition has very well recorded how people reacted to these times and what kinds of things they came up with and how they were able to take these principles from the Hadith and from the Quran and implement them into their lives. So very briefly to discuss what meaning making is, it's, it refers to uh, some, one of the findings uh, from other studies before this is that belief systems guide individuals in the process of meaning making which means that it helps them establish these mental representation of possible relationships among things, events, and relationships. And so we know how this can, we can see how this will be very important in times of pandemic, where you need to make a connection of, as Dr. Rania was mentioning in her presentation and on how people are connecting the, their situation to their lives. Is this a punishment from God? Is this a test from God? Is this a mercy from God? And so we'll see uh, very shortly specific examples of how Islamic scripture guides this process and Islamic history shows how these principles can be applied. Our first sphere we'll look at is the personal response of how Muslims responded to their situation in themselves. And so the, the main basis for this uh, in the way that it's framed from the Quran is uh, uh, God says in the Quran, verily Allah does not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. So it's turning the focus inwards and looking at how are we responding within ourselves before we see how everything around us is going to start improving. And so just as our time right now we have, there's heightened fear and anxiety. We've... Uh, We've seen that very clearly in our own time, and it's very clear throughout the historical records. We see many instances of entire neighborhoods uh, in the Levant that were turned into graveyards because of the amount of people that were passing away during the Mamluk period. So there is these incredible uh, images of grief and loss and despair, and they were able to overcome these situations. So we could learn from that. And so today, one of the main ways that people are receiving that they're having this fear and anxiety build up, it's coming from news, social media, seeing the numbers of people getting ill, seeing images of the hospitals overcrowded, the ICU beds filled up, and even uh, in some cases, the, the, the amount of burial that was happening. And while those, that same extent might have not been present at, uh, historically, we have this other phenomenon of travelers bearing news of plague. And it created a sense of fear because the people in a, in, a, in a town that had this news that plague is coming, they weren't able to validate what the actual statistics were. They weren't able to validate how they should prepare, but they just had this impending fear of the plague that was coming. And so, and just like that, we have the same, uh, in terms of grief and fear, they 
uh, at the time that everything was their communal life led them to be a part. There was public funerals. They saw their neighbors uh, being afflicted by the plague. Just as we, uh, even in our quarantine, we're receiving news either from people we know, from uh, shit posts shared online, and in some cases, uh, may God protect us of our own loved ones who are being afflicted by our pandemic. And then, so the ways that this that this can lead people to, we see that some people were led historically, they were led to superstition. They lost sight of the divine wisdom and instead they started taking to superstitious actions to try to protect themselves. They were paying char for charms and amulets and other, uh, and other such things and believing that they could ward off any harm uh, through money and through superstitious acts. Uh, whereas others, they, they started looking for a po positive outlook and accepting their reality, accepting their station, and accepting that there is a divine wisdom behind it that guided them to have a content state. And in one case, the poet Ibn al he uh, a few days before he, uh, he actually passed away from the plague in uh, 1349 in Syria, he said, unlike others, I do not fear the pandemic for it affords me two possible outcomes, each better than the other. If I die, then I find rest away from the contagions of the world. If I live, I get to witness more of the world through the healing of my ears and eyes. So he comes to be content because he recognizes that God has a divine wisdom in this situation. And so in the way that we model it, uh, some people today we see as there were superstitious acts from before, there are people going to unproven remedies. There are people taking means that may not be productive and may not be beneficial for them. And in other cases, uh, there is something of a selfish instinct that we saw, especially early on in the pandemic, people trying to hoard uh, the resources, the things that they thought that they would need. And it led to this very impulsive action, just as there was impulsive action from before. And this response, it comes in a, in a violation of our principles because we, we, it's, if we think that this is the only way that we're going to protect ourselves, then it is, then it goes against what we believe in terms of God having a wisdom in this and providing for us in these situations. Whereas the second response is based on our beliefs, it's based on deliberate action and realizing these Islamic principles in our response of being content and knowing that there is a wisdom behind it and it's for us to turn into ourselves and to look at our uh, situation look at our state and come to terms with our with our uh, situation so that we can become begin to better that situation we can begin to realize the the, the good that will come out of it and then another thing that we see very prominently, especially right now in our uh, age of quarantine, and I think even just uh, a testament to this is the fact that right now we are here on, on this online meeting instead of in person, that isolation and loneliness is something that's grown exponentially in the past months, something that was already listed as, uh, as an epidemic from before our pandemic, uh, being loneliness and isolation, that now we see it spread to every sphere of our life. And this is definitely something that people uh, experience historically we see many accounts of people quarantining and isolating and uh, not being able to enter and as Dr. Rania uh, showed the hadith that mentions that if you're in a that, uh, not to enter a land with plague so people that were separated in different towns in different cities they were not able to come back to their families and to their home and so uh, a specific uh, a specific mentioning of one of the scholars in this regard is uh, that of Ibn Atta Allah al-Iskandari, who was one of the great scholars of spirituality of the Islamic tradition. And he said, when God isolates you from his creation, know that he wants to open the door of intimacy with him to you. So uh, the response to isolation that we see from the scholars and from the historical accounts was focused on reframing the isolation to seclusion with God, that this is a time for people to build healthy habits. And I think that this has definitely been the case for many people, as we saw in Dr. Rania's study, that people during Ramadan, uh, even though they were isolated from their communities, they were turning to Tarawih, they were turning to their prayers, they were turning to time with the Quran, and it was allowing them to build healthy habits and a healthy attitude so that uh, inshallah, if God wills and when God wills, we return to a communal lifestyle. We have these healthy habits built up and we are able to interact with one another in a better way than uh, before. 
Then entering into the second sphere of the response is the communal response. So we learn from many instances throughout the Quran and throughout the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, we see the importance of the community. And one such hadith uh, mentions that the religion is sincerity to God, his book, his messenger, and the leaders of the Muslims and the masses of the Muslims. And so this, uh, along with being sincere to God and to his book and to his messenger, is coupled with being sincere to to the Muslims, both the leaders and the generality, just the masses of the Muslims, to our Muslim community. And so there's this heavy importance on maintaining the integrity of our communities. Companionship is integral. And, uh, and we know that in the Islamic conception of the human being, even just from the word insan, from the word man, it, it's one of the opinions of the roots is that it comes from from uns, from being, uh, from intimacy, from being close to one another, because he, we have this human need of be, of being of having companionship and having community. So, how do we maintain these aspects while we are isolated, while we're separated, at the very least, just by screens in this time? And so, one some of the ways that we saw the community coming together in historical times is that many people took to volunteering and this was needed as there were so many people passing away there were so many ill that they were needed people to help with burials as entire uh, as we mentioned before entire neighborhoods were disappearing as people were passing away and people volunteered to do this there were unpaid uh, workers that came and they started managing the and start managing the uh, the burial of their neighbors and of these of their uh, brothers and sisters in Islam, and then we also see that they began encouraging one another. There were announcements that were made at the at uh, at the cities and by the rulers, reminding people to fast and pray and engage in good actions of. Uh, of, of prayer and of supplication to ask God to lift these afflictions, and then at the same time they gave each other reminders of removing sinful acts. And this is something that is mentioned by some of the scholars is that these plagues, they said, it comes because of certain acts, certain harmful acts that uh, began, that became widespread throughout the community. So they, they advised one another, avoid these, these negative responses, avoid things like alcohol, things that uh, started to, to spread throughout the community that they were reminded of one another in order to lift our condition, we change these things with one another. And then uh, finally, the, the one other way that they helped their community was just in quarantining to protect one and to protect oneself and the community from the harm of a pandemic. And so our modern modeling in this case, this is one of the places in which we are very fortunate to have the, the benefit of the internet, the benefit of technology is that we can connect with one another and we can still do some of these same acts as encouraging one another in prayer and supplication and reading the Quran. And we can do it through means like this, through Zoom and, uh, and other virtual means. So some of the ways in which people have come together over the past year is through establishing virtual book clubs, sharing lectures online, many, com many uh, community events that have been hosted online for both, uh, for both Ramadan and Eid and also just weekly reminders for people. And so they're replacing these, these communal events with virtual ones to help, uh, to help people. And then now, so uh, going into some of our last topics here, we'll see the view of the pandemic as mercy or punishment. And so this comes from, there's two hadiths that we looked at here in regards to how, how people in the community will view this, uh, their, state, their state in the pandemic and in history and plagues. And so the first of these is the hadith that mentions that uh, every, that all of the affairs of the believer have good in it. And, uh, and so the, and the hadith says here, if he receives prosperity, he shows gratitude and that is good for him. If he is afflicted by adversity, he shows patience and that is good for him. So that's our first principle, that any adversity is a chance for good for the believer because he can respond in a way that is pleasing to God. And then the next one is specifically about plagues and specifically about pandemics, where the wife of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aisha, asked him about the plague. 
And he said, it is the punishment God sends on whom he wills from his servants. And it is that Allah makes it a mercy for the believers as not one of them stays in his land during a plague, remaining patient, seeking reward from God, knowing that nothing can afflict him except what God has written for him, except that he is he, that his is like the reward of the martyr. So it's giving the very high station to the person. And this isn't even anything specific. It's not about somebody going out and serving the community in a time of plague. It's just about somebody staying in their land so observing that uh, isolation, remaining patient, having this positive attitude, seeking reward from God, increasing in acts of good work, and that knowing, having just this complete faith and hope in God that good will come. So there's a balance of hope and fear. We balance our hope in God's mercy that things will become better, but we have the fear that if we don't work on ourselves, then it will, then there could, then the situation could be prolonged. And in the same way, we have this balance of reliance and independence that Muslims ultimately rely that God will protect them from harm and give them the best in every situation, but that God has given them means to protect themselves as well. So such things as seeking uh, medical attention when needed, uh, vaccines, and then in terms of mental health, when one is suffering to seek professional attention in order to protect themselves, because it's that balance of having that reliance on God and showing that reliance of God by showing that you take the means that he has given. <clears throat> and then as for the conclusion, to recap some of the points that we looked at, is that the importance of the historical responses, it provides modern Muslims with real examples to look to. And an example of one of the, one of the very beautiful scenes reported by the two uh, major historians and chroniclers, um, Ibn Battuta and Ibn Kathir, they mention a case in uh, Memlukul Damascus in the 16th century uh, during the plague. And, and the ruler uh, at the time, he, he gave two orders. The first order was that the, the public eateries be closed so that the spread of the pandemic could be controlled. And then the second is he asked the people and he told the people to fast for three days. And at the end of the three days, they all came out from each community, the Muslims, the Christians, the Jews, even, uh, even the very small minority communities like Samaritans and others, Zoroastrians, uh, I believe, they all went out into the, into the countryside outside of the city and they were all praying to God. And they were all making these prayers uh, and asking that God lift the condition. And so for this balance of adding both the taking the means of closing eateries and observing that isolation, and at the same time, having this positive attitude, praying to God, uh, the chroniclers, they, the historians, they record how the cases of the spread of the plague and the deaths began to decrease dramatically as opposed to other places. So we see these very concrete examples of how the historical responses can give us examples to model having hope and, ha and keeping our faith in the means that we have and in God uh, ultimately. And then our religious response giving us these principles to enact in our lives and to uh, proceed with the best of with the best of mindsets and the best of ways in order to make these meaning make going through this meaning making making process and having an understanding of how we can uh, we can come out of this pandemic with good and with the best of uh, intentions and the best of actions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yusuf. I love the balance slide. That was my favorite. Um, we're ready at this time for Professor Rafiq. Professor Rafiq, if you wanted to share your screen, wonderful. And I will spotlight you. Yeah, you can you people uh, see my screen? Yes, we can see you and hear you very well. The screen is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, very good evening from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, wonderful uh, presentation by Dr. Rania and Yusuf, and I think so. This is the need of the time, and I uh, really congratulate uh, Muslim Mental Health uh, Unit for arranging this conference in times when we need to discuss all the things related to COVID. And my uh, presentation is somewhat similar to what my other presenters have presented in this session. So I will be talking about the reported mental health issues during COVID-19 pandemic in Punjab, Pakistan. Uh, 
My co-authors are Dr. Atifa Anjum and Dr. Fatma Kamran from the Institute of Applied Psychology, University of the Punjab. So uh, the, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, as the rest of the speakers have talked about, uh, we can see the impact. It has a societal consequences of mass home confinement. A stressful situation has developed for many across the globe. And disease spread risk, lockdown, and resulting social and financial issues have led coronavirus to become a leading risk factor for mental health. Life has radically changed for the worst for most of the people as unprecedented rates of job loss, isolation, and COVID-19 related deaths and infections continue in Pakistan. Due to the sudden nature of the outbreak, uh, I would like to tell that the first case of COVID was reported on 27 February 2020 in uh, the city of Karachi in Pakistan. So the infectious power of the virus, fear, anxiety, depression, and other stress reactions are likely to surface, and they are seen in most of the population. So it has become a public menace and the public psychological concern. Researchers worldwide have studied uh, the mental health effects of this pandemic. Researchers in China examined psychological responses during the initial stage of the COVID-19 ep epidemic that was uh, during the last year when it initially started in the general population and found that 53.8% of respondents rated the psychological impact of the outbreak as moderate to severe. Being forced to stay at home, work from home, do homeschooling with children, drastically minimize outings, reduce social interactions. We being Muslims, as like Yusuf was talking about, we believe in a community, we live in communities, we live together. So that has drastically affected our mental health. And then working many hours from home and under stressful circumstances and in parallel manage the attendant health risks can have a major impact on our daily functioning. So the study on the public psychological states and its related factors during the COVID-19 outbreak is of practical significance. Initial existing literature uh, was that in US also, uh, there was a study that was conducted and 775 adults were studied. Uh, they were functionally impaired by the fear and anxiety of the coronavirus exhibited greater hopelessness, suicidal ideation, spiritual crisis, and use of alcohol and drug as coping. Like Dr. Rania was talking about uh, the Muslim population, where the Muslims started using religious and spiritual coping. So dysfunctional coronavirus anxiety, generalized anxiety, depression, and functional impairment were the reported uh, factors. And dysfunctional coronavirus anxiety was associated with coronavirus infection, generalized anxiety, depression, functional impairment, perceived lack of social support, and suicidal ideation. So when this uh, uh, outbreak started in Pakistan, I gave a statement in one of the local newspapers that pandemic is going to end, but the long-term psychological impact is likely to continue for many years to come. So based on uh, this uh, rational that large number of people tend to experience clinically significant fear and anxiety during an infectious disease outbreak, it is vital for health professionals, psychologists, psychiatrists, medical doctors to understand the psychological challenges during times of pandemic. The results of the survey are of great practical significance to the information provision, cognition, behavior guidance, and psychology psychological support of individuals and government at all levels. So uh, the Institute of Applied Psychology came forward and we established our first mental health helpline uh, that we named as COVID-19 mental health helpline in order to help to find out the people what were the different uh, psychological factors the people were facing and how these factors can be managed. And the Institute uh, joined hands with the telemedicine services that were being provided by the government of Pakistan. So uh, these are some of the pictures of our students uh, who were working uh, for this telemedicine and uh, telepsychiatric helpline and mental health helpline of the Institute. So the aim of the study uh, was to identify mental health concerns of community reported during COVID-19 pandemic, but I would like to add in that I'm talking about the first wave of pandemic, and I will be telling about uh, the sample, uh, the months uh, during which we took the sample to explore existence of mental health concerns in the context of different demographic characteristics. Coming to the participants and procedures of the study, this study, you 
supplies and data gathered from mental health helpline and a telemedicine services initiated to callers reporting at mental health helpline and telemedicine centers to see seek mental health services for different psychological complaints to August uh, 2020. <clears throat> Due to online nature of the data, information collected from the participant was kept to the minimum. So there are certain demographics of those seeking psychological help. People who reported that are uh, telemedicine and our mental health helpline, 65% were women. And uh, overall, 87% uh, men and women were li living in joint family system. That is the usually the culture here, though it is changing nowadays. So overall, 72% callers reported psychological issues. And the most commonly reported psychological issues during the first wave of pandemic were anxiety. Then it was uh, followed by sleep problems, then depression. And there were other uh, problems also reported by the callers like stress, anger, regression, repetitive thoughts, panic attacks, and somatic symptoms. Gender-wise distribution of overall psychological concerns, you can see that uh, women reported more psychological concerns, whereas it was an interesting thing to find out that the men who were calling us at our telemedicine helpline, they were uh, more worried about their economic condition and they wanted some economic help. So uh, coming to the gender-wise distribution of psychological concerns, you can see that women reported all concerns greater than men, except for anger and aggression, which was reported more by the men who were reporting at the mental health helpline. Uh, rest, the women reported higher, uh, higher concerns like anxiety, depression, sleep problems, repetitive thoughts of catching coronavirus, panic attacks, and somatic symptoms. So if if we look at the age-wise distribution of the reported uh, mental health concerns, you can see that the age bra bracket between 18 to 25 and those between 26 to 35 reported anxiety as their major concern. And then uh, the age bracket between 36 to 45, uh, their major concern was panic. And uh, uh, again, uh, the panic was the major concern for people 45 and above, which I would be discussing in the discussion, why they uh, reported more panic. So causes of concern uh, reported by men was fear of losing job, fear of catching COVID-19 and disruption of routine. Whereas women uh, reported feeling of helplessness, fear of catching COVID-19 and being overworked because they were uh, working at home and they had to look after the children as well as the joint uh, women who were living in joint family. They had to look after the rest of the family members and everybody was at home and nobody was prepared. So they were overburdened. Psychological concerns compared to callers below 50 years of age, callers 50 and above age reported 1.5 times greater number of psychological concerns and 69% callers reported having comorbid physical health condition. 7% uh, reported already diagnosed uh, having a psychological disorder and 24 reported calling to uh, this helpline for the first time because we initiated uh, this uh, helpline uh, when the cases started increasing. It was uh, one of the first helpline that was started in Pakistan. So uh, we did a small survey also uh, considering that the students had to uh, study online and the students were not prepared, neither the uh, faculty was prepared to deliver online nor the students were prepared and everybody left the colleges and universities in haste thinking that it was a period in which they are going to have vacations. So uh, it was important to study the mental health issues reported by college and university students. So among the callers, 56% were girls and the age of uh, student boys was uh, the, uh, who called us was between 18 to 25 years and age of student girls was between 17 to 22 years. And the most common concerns reported uh, were stress followed by a sad mood. And uh, then there were other concerns like uh, internet uh, addiction, time management concerns, and uh, sleep issues, and anxiety issues. So most uh, highly reported issues 
who are anxiety and sleep problems. Existing research also indicates that anxiety symptoms are most comorbid and overlap with COVID-19 symptomology. Uh, today, I was talking uh, to one of the clients mm -hmm. and she had just come out of uh, this COVID uh, and uh, got her test negative, but she was saying that she is in severe depression. So I think so depression and anxiety are part and parcel of COVID symptomology. Due to uh, contagious nature, fear of catching disease leads to constant anxiety. Since there was a great degree of uncertainty about sources of transfer, diagnosis, and treatment, it uh, caused anxiety, especially during the first wave of pandemic. There is sufficient theoretical and research evidence indicating uncertainty as a major cause of anxiety and stress, uh, as was in case of dengue fever when, it, uh, when we had its outbreak in Pakistan. Stress-related sleep problems are common, and those sensitive to stress-related sleep disruptions are most likely to develop chronic insomnia. Studies on COVID anxiety have shown that sleep has been a major concern. Uh, Wang reported 38% participants above the cutoff for sleep disturbance in their study sample during COVID-19. Uh, sleep is basically affected by disruption of routine and uh, with the students especially they reported that they uh, they uh, sleep and uh, that is why their routine got uh, so factors really contributing uh, towards better sleep quality include bright daylight exposure meal times exercise physical activity staying awake during the day following routines and all were affected uh, specifically the uh, younger population they did not follow any routines so increase use of uh, devices even for people uh, like us because we were not uh, used to uh, using the devices and this virtual world was totally new to us also. So this further exhibited the uh, sleep concerns. Depression was a result of helplessness in case of COVID-19 faced in initial months and result of frustration due to confinement and disruption of routine and economic loss also. And specifically, they were uh, not used to sitting at home. And uh, that was one of the more important reason that many of the cases, though initially when they called, they did not report, but use specifically emotional abuse, physical abuse increased. And if we uh, see the statistics for the third wave, there has been a drastic increase in the divorce rate in Pakistan also and uh, increase in domestic violence. So repetitive thoughts of contamination and related behaviors were a direct result of media campaign for awareness about spread and control of the virus. And initially, um, during the first uh, phase of pandemic, we were getting all sorts of uh, information. Some was authentic, some was not authentic. So the anxiety, uh, as we were taking in all sorts of media information without considering the authenticity, so uh, the anxiety due to uh, coronavirus was more at that time. So females reported higher level of symptoms except anger and aggression as compared to men. And it is quite uh, understandable because women in Pakistan, they, uh, it is a cultural norm that they should not get angry and express their aggression. So mental health statistics prior uh, to the COVID outbreak as well as during both confirmed these findings that females usually report greater concerns. Fear of losing job was a major stressor for men because men are the breadwinners, usually the breadwinners in Pakistan, since the situation actually posed threat to financial status of many and required tangible solutions. For women, fear of COVID was a major concern since they reported not only fearful for themselves, but they also reported that they were fearful for their family, their children and their parents. Those above the age of 50 reported greater psychological issues since statistics on COVID-19 show that this age group is at a greater risk. So the information they were taking in through media, they made, uh, the information made them more anxious. So although the study made use of a smaller data set relative to many other studies conducted across the group, it is the, one of the first study of its nature in Pakistan. The study identifies and highlights the grave situation that is cause of psychological concern. A majority of people reporting to helpline more than once uh, indicated that people were under stress and required psychological help. Those who already 
had any diagnosed mental health issue, they were unable to access the mental health facilities. So uh, their problems started to get worse. The study helps in raising public and government level awareness for psychological aspects of the situation and to take practical measures to handle it. So uh, briefly, uh, the Institute started off a campaign because we were able to find out what were the target areas we had to address. Uh, so the campaign was started by the Institute of Applied Psychology. That was the COVID free Pakistan campaign. It was virtual campaign followed by many other campaigns. We set up uh, in order to address this mental health cri crisis, online training sessions, virtual sessions were started off. Then we uh, started with the first conference in order to help uh, the psychologist design a protocol for volunteers to uh, of mental health helpline in wake of coronavirus. So psychologists from all over the country joined us. And then uh, there were uh, other uh, webinars addressing how to maintain and sustain mental health during uh, this first wave and appeal for peace in homes because many of the callers started calling us and they reported abuse and increase in domestic violence so we started off with uh, different sorts of webinars addressing those areas i personally myself started a one minute video series in order to address all the uh, different sectors of population like the older adults, the women, the, uh, the, the working women, the housewives, the children, the older population, how to maintain and sustain positivity during lockdown. And short programs were recorded by the Institute in order to help and psychoeducate the public at large. And uh, thank you very much. I always uh, end up or start my presentation with this uh, dua uh, for coronavirus. Allahumma afni fi badani, Allahumma afni fi sami, Allahumma afni fi basari, la ilaha illa anta. May God protect us all uh, from this deadly virus. And uh, I hope that the, this year we are able to get rid of this pandemic. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much for the presentation, um, you can uh, hit that stop share and that will take that screen away. Gee. Okay. Normally, I cannot... your screen to hota hai thoda sa. Okay. Haan, ji, mother, I cannot see it. Pause share. Stop share. That's now I can see it. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. So much good information. Um, my head's kind of spinning, Dr. Nazir. All yours to put it all into perspective for us. Uh, thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. As-salamu ala Sayyid al-Mursalim. Uh, first of all, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me thank the organizers of uh, this conference to invite me for a comment. It's been really delightful to listen to all these wonderful presenters that brought new insight to us. Their presentations were quite illuminating and insightful and enlightening. And I thank all of them. But let me give you a little bit of perspective before I go on discussion. Through my WHO colleagues in Geneva, when I was attending a meeting in November of 2019, I was aware that there is a mysterious outbreak of a virus going on in Wuhan, China. Then until December 29, 2019, it was officially announced by the WHO. And I recall uh, 
during the first week of January, I started writing a editorial about this virus. Uh, and then the, the editorial was actually immediately uh, published in the Journal of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. And I do recall in my editorial, I said, if this virus, because this relates actually to psychosocial issues that discussed, here, if this virus uses ACE2 receptors, which is very abundant in the body, it will be very devastating, I recall. And keep in mind at the time when I was preparing that editorial, there was no name such as COVID or SARS-CoV-2 invention. Actually, the title of my paper was Viral Diseases of, Viral Disease of Wuhan, China, because I had no other name. Now we know uh, SARS-CoV-2 and then, you know, COVID, which is a nomenclature by WHO. So I was always concentrating on the clinical aspect, pathophysiological aspect and immunological aspect, and not having enough knowledge in the other side of the spectrum, which is mental health. Really personally, when I was reading the abstracts of these three presenters, and now I listened, it added to my personal knowledge. And, and personal appreciation for the other side of this pandemic, which is psychosocial. So if I were to just say, what is the commonalities of these three presentation, I would say one word, psychosocial. So let's just go as a background and in Islam, you know, and uh, uh, it's, it's a belief system, as everybody alluded to that, you know, and, uh, and the community activity belief system, you know, and uh, Yusuf quoted very eloquently the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, you know. So this pandemic really affected everybody, including uh, uh, Muslim, you know, communities at large, you know. But keep in mind there are Muslim countries like Iran, like Lebanon. They had the highest rate of transmission. Iran is next to Pakistan, okay. And, and tremendous mortality was associated in Iranian COVID, let's say, compared to Saudi Arabia, you know, or Qatar or United Arab Emirates, you know. So I, I think this is something we need to keep in mind, which by the way, the higher the transmission rate, we know, you know, more hospitalization, you know, and more psychosocial issues. Although there is another aspect of this COVID that I will address it, you know, in my concluding remark, you know. So, Islam really is, is a belief system in safeguarding, you know, communities, you know. And as all three presenters, they mentioned, you know, these community activities were really disrupted and, uh, and to the point that COVID-19 has significantly increased levels of anxiety and stress. And this is not, by the way, my statement, this is from the American Medical Society. And you can see here, this uh, Muslim lady is in Beirut and she is reciting the Holy Quran. And then here you see in Pakistan, okay, which is in Urdu. And basically this mark say, you know, we are in lockdown position, you know. And, and then here, that's the Iranian scenario where they had the highest, you know, uh, rate of transmission and, and mortality. So when I made my comments, please keep in mind, was based on the abstracts I received uh, 
from Mary Ferdosi, which I would like to acknowledge her contribution here, you know. But during each presentations made just today, I made a couple of remarks that I would like to bring, but, but, but in general, my assessment of each presentation was based on the abstracts that they forwarded, you know, to me. Starting with uh, Professor Rafiq, and there are several key points, but the three important key points of her presentation would be the job security and, of course, disruption of job and work, you know, and anxiety and, and stress. And this really highlights, you know, that uh, some Muslim communities and states in, in general, they need to have improved psychosocial you know, care. The strength of this work was, you know, uh, excellent uh, data sample, you know, gathering. And uh, as I understand, they were all obtained, you know, from uh, uh, telemed. But, but I also made, you know, a couple of, you know, remarks myself, you know. Uh, she eloquently alluded on sleep disturbances, you know, anger and violence, you know, and, and especially uh, domestic violence, you know. So where do we go with, with this presentation? You know, what's the take home message, you know? And that is in collaboration with spiritual centers, psychosocial crisis prevention and intervention. This is what I perceived from this presentation. There should be models, you know, and these models should be urgently developed by the governments and healthcare agencies, you know, but also other stakeholders, you know, we often ignore the role of other stakeholders, you know, such as imams, mosques, you know, community leaders, you know. So that is the message, you know, uh, I think, you know, this presentation and the abstract sent out very important and extremely uh, illuminating. The next presentation was by Yusuf Khan. The key points were, we really work in a new reality. And Yusuf eloquently discussed it, you know. And he also explained the long-term adaptive, you know, response and and he went to basically a historical perspective, you know, explaining plagues, you know, especially the Muslim Mediterranean, you know, region, you know. So the implications of his presentation is, you know, uh, the impact of this pandemic on collective, you know, workshop, you know, and, and also uh, the pivotal role of mental health, you know, practitioners, you know, and how can, they can help, you know, alleviate some of these uh, psychological, you know, uh, and psychosomatic, you know, symptoms, you know. He brought an excellent, I uh, would say, historical perspective. Yusuf, thank you so much. You know, sometimes we need to learn from history, okay? Especially, I love that uh, Islamic Mediterranean, which is, by the way, I grew up in Paris, France, and I'm well-versed, you know, on history of, uh, uh, Islamic Spain, and uh, as a matter of fact, I, I visited all those sites, you know, and I look forward, you know, to go back after I retire to revisit, you know, uh, areas, you know, that I love to see again, you know. So the take-home message from uh, Yusuf's presentation was, yes, uh, this pandemic has caused unparalleled challenge uh, in spirituality, but I felt from this presentation that there is integrative need, you know, and as a matter of fact, Dr. Avad, you know, mentioned that, you know, seeking mental health office visit, you know, but also applying pillars of faith, you know, to reduce the suffering that exists from this COVID-19, especially uh, the, the these are the critical component, you know, and, and I would like to emphasize, you know, again, the role of, you know, uh, psychology, you know, and, and mental health in alleviating some of these uh, uh, calamities that the Muslim communities currently are facing. Now, it's not only Muslim communities, you know, 
uh, Muslim communities alike, you know, as well, you know, it's, it's keep in mind, it's, it's pandemic, you know. Then uh, Dr. Abad uh, made a very insightful uh, presentation. The, the key points are elevated stress in, in some communities, disruption of uh, rituals and, and most importantly she mentioned that social isolation you know and then you know she presented excellent data on Ramadan you know and, and the statistics you know she, she gave you know so her uh, presentation identifies you know how severe uh, the, the depression might be you know and, and although uh, Back in Paris, you know, I, I remember, you know, when I was uh, learning about uh, depression, uh, I remember that dopamine versus serotonin, you know. It seems to me, though, this pandemic has caused an imbalance of uh, dopamine versus serotonin. Although uh, I'm not expert, I'm a French trained hematopathologist. And I leave it up to experts today to comment on dopamine, you know, and, and serotonin. And certainly, uh, as a clinician, she emphasized on the role of both spiritual care, you know, and and, and medical care. I, I really liked her her study because it was a large scale study. The statistics are really, you know, meaningful. So, what do we learn from from her presentation? Well the clinical and spiritual management of social isolation mental issue again i emphasize that's the terminology i made social isolation mental issues along with you know psychological interventions uh, people affected by covid you know really takes a priority in muslim states you know and, and communities you know as we go along but keep in mind you know uh, there are distinct, you know, customs and cultures in each Islamic countries, which I don't want to get into it unless we have a time to, to discuss it in the context of presentations, you know, today. So on, on final analysis, first of all, I would like to remind everybody, you know, the presentations made today were about people in general, you know. But I hope next year, this conference would focus on the existing psychological conditions that you know, are presented with people who already survived this COVID, you know, who, who, who had COVID, either mild or, or, or severe or mild, you know, and, and believe it or not, I do consult with many countries on these issues. Uh, yesterday, I was having, you know, a COVID webinar with Mexico, you know, and there are so many psychological, you know, issues with regard to those who recovered from this disease and let alone, you know, clinical issues. So the, the so-called long haulers, you know, and I, always keep hearing log callers, but now it's time actually that the psychological issues should be locked in into the long haulers, you know, uh, clinical issues that uh, people are, you know, e experiencing, you know, uh, there are at least, you know, 83 symptoms associated uh, with those who, you know, recovered from this COVID, not everybody, but, but some of them, you know, so we still have challenges, you know. Uh, our challenges are identification of uh, the risk communities. Now, I would like to suggest for the next year conference, you know, the Muslim mental health condition of two distinct, two distinct Muslim communities. One would be Rohingya of Burma, Myanmar, the other one would be the Muslims of Western China, okay? And uh, I, I have news uh, that in Western China, the Muslims, uh, the, the Uyghur Muslims, they're primarily denied of uh, basic COVID medical care, let alone vaccination 
is not very common in that part. So I hope uh, those who are listening to me for the next year, they focus on the mental issues of Rohingya Muslims and, and, and uh, the Uyghur, or we call it Uyghur Muslims. The other thing is we always keep hearing the public health intervention. But this is the time that this conference should send out the message. It should be an integrated mental health and public health intervention at the level of infrastructure, capacity building, and specifically educational programs. You know, I think for the Muslim states by and large, you know, economic recovery is really a challenge. And and I'm not an economist, uh, but I would like to hear about that economic recovery because we live in a reality, 21st century reality, you know, our economy is tied up to, to our well-being one way or other, although we're all faithful, you know, people, but at some point it affects, you know, the well-being in general, you know. Then we have vaccination issues, and I, I know that on April 12th, we have a webinar on COVID-19, and, uh, and uh, it will be me and Dr. Zaki and, uh, and Dr. Farah Abbasi, you know, everybody will talk about his or his own, her own specialty, but I'll be focusing actually on COVID issues that exist in Yemen, because uh, I've been studying Yemen for, for many years, you know. And then, you know, uh, the Ramadan prayers, you know, uh, one of the speakers, you know, uh, on, on the basis of the statistics alluded that, you know, most people felt uh, that their prayers were not, you know, uh, uh, interrupted or they were reading prayers in the house, you know, or virtual, you know, contact with the mosque, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, but also I would like to emphasize, uh, and, and this is highly important, the role of academic centers, you know, like Professor Rafiq, you know, she mentioned about it, you know, in, in the Muslim world, you know, and how they should communicate with imams, with, with mosques and community leaders, not, not only about COVID, 19 necessarily, you know, health in, in general. I think, you know, I've been in most uh, Muslim countries uh, and as a consultant WHO, I probably did 150 countries, you know, all together, you know, especially at the time I was working in Africa on HIV AIDS program, you know, and uh, I think it is incumbent upon uh, Islamic, you know, universities and academic centers, you know, to more effectively communicate, you know, with, with, with community leaders. So the take home message from this slide is uh, during the COVID pandemic, Muslim communities need to make sure their members are receiving spiritual and mental health care. So with this, you know, I close my uh, discussion and I believe uh, Dr. Kosla can now bring this into uh, comment and questions. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Nasiri. Um, I don't see the questions in the chat there, but I have a few. Um, the first one I have is for Dr. Awad. I am wondering if you have plans for a post-COVID Ramadan study to see if things changed between then and, and, and post-COVID. Well, we have definitely been talking about whether we should um, do a follow-up to take another pulse check, if you will, on how people are doing this year, you know, a year out of the, uh, out from COVID when it first started. And um, I think we're still in the process of trying to sort that out with our partner, um, the Yaqeen Institute. But I agree with you, it would be a lovely um, and important study to undertake. Uh, can I have a question? Can I ask a question? Please. Yeah. Uh, for Dr. Awad and uh, Professor Rafiq, you know, uh, we know that the prescriptions uh, with regard to antidepressant increased during COVID pandemic. I came across with numerous, you know, communications plus the uh, WHO communications. So uh, we don't know yet, right? I mean, what percent of uh, Muslim 
let us say at the community level, at the country level, and this also goes to Pakistan as well, are currently using antidepressants. And that information can, can be very helpful to obtain. Uh, using anti, sorry, I did not catch your question. Antidepressant, antidepressant. For, uh, for people who, uh, uh, for depression overall? For depression and anxiety during COVID pandemic. Uh, first of all, uh, the people, who, uh, uh, the help is not available there because you know that we are again in this mode of lockdown partial lockdown and uh, because uh, their uh, the transport concern i am talking specifically about these two weeks so the people who were already on medicine it is uh, quite difficult for them to get the medical help by the psychiatric help but yes some of the people who were already on antidepressants they are taking antidepressants but uh, being a psychologist, I cannot comment much more on uh, the use of antidepressants because uh, we are helping the people through psychotherapy, through counseling, through uh, other uh, things like time management techniques, like um, stress management techniques. So definitely, uh, but the, the concept here is not to take medicine. That is the concept of the general public, not to take medicine because uh, of a number of uh, factors. So. People are usually not into medication, but specifically with reference to severe depression, clinical depression, and other things, yes, definitely, then they are put onto uh, antipsychotics. Uh, Dr. Avad, what's your experience in California? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear the question. Yeah, what's your experience uh, in California with regard to antidepressants and COVID Certainly, what we found here is is similarly the the number the rates as you mentioned the percentages of people using um, medications has increased and in general the percentages of mental health um, diagnoses have also increased in this pandemic. So we have um, what I call a crisis or a pandemic within a pandemic, a crisis within a crisis. Really, is what we're seeing. Um, and for many, even if they don't have the physical um, effects or symptoms of COVID, some will get that and some won't, of course, but nearly most people will feel the effect mental health-wise. This is definitely what we're finding. Wonderful. Thank you all. This brings us to the end of our panel. That's all the time we have. I want to take a minute to thank all our attendees for coming and all our panelists for joining in. Thank you, Dr. Rafiq, for sharing us your unique intervention and opening our eyes to how economy can disproportionately affect people with COVID. Thank you, Dr. Awad. I look forward to seeing the study published and hopefully a post one. Um, thank you, Yusuf, for adding the past to the present beautifully, and Dr. Nasiri for bringing your global health perspective to putting it all in. Thank you all, please join us uh, for our next session at 1045. Um, it's great to see you all here and we hope to see you soon back again for the next panel. Thank you very much, Salaam Alaikum. <laughs>